Um, the next session is the Spotlight Talks. Uh, it has been a tradition at RSS to have spotlights. And uh, these are uh, some of the younger uh, members of our community. They are selected by the RSS board. This year, Dieter Fox, our program chair, was responsible for this selection, for organizing uh, the um, selection, not the actual selection, I'm sorry, the whole board was involved, but for organizing the process. And we have two exceptional people today who are uh, going, who's, uh, each of uh, whom was given a 30 minute uh, slot. And I have asked uh, Ken Goldberg to chair this session. Thank you, Lydia. Can you hear me? No, oh, there we go. You can hear me. Um, <clears throat> so, um, thank you, Lydia, for the opportunity. I, uh, I, I appreciate your bra bravery because the last time I was asked to introduce a speaker um, was about 10 years ago, and um, I introduced with an uh, interpretive dance. Um, that will not be happening today. I did consider it, but actually the work of these two scholars I, did not lend itself to interpretive dance. <coughs> um, but I did, think, uh, I did think I'd give you a bit of, uh, of poetry. And, um, and it's, it's, about, it's because this year we celebrate a very important um, anniversary of a historic injustice and rebellion. Um, how many of you remember the year of the, uh, the, 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 the classic ICRA in 93 or 94 when there was a, uh, a great controversy about the reviews? Put your hand up if you remember this. Okay, not everyone. So I'll just tell you very quickly what happened was there was a major snafu in the way the reviews were done at ICRA. And as a result, um, researchers got one-line reviews of their papers, oftentimes very negative. And it was, a, it was just a huge outrage, a huge howl of unrest about this. And uh, people were really just fed up with the, this, the, this machinery of the, uh, of the IEEE that would, you know, we were burdened by this organization that had failed us so massively. And so um, I want to recall an important speech that happened um, that we're celebrating the anniversary of this year as follows. <clears throat> there comes a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you just can't take part. You can't even passively take part. You've got to put your bodies on the gears, upon the wheels, upon the levers of the apparatus, and you have to make it stop. You've got to indicate to those people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, unless you're given that freedom that you deserve fundamentally, the machine will be prevented from working at all. <laughs> OK, that was, uh, that, I'm paraphrasing. That was not um, Sebastian Thrun. Um, speaking to the IEEE exactly, but that was pretty much his message. Um, actually, that was Mario Savio. And it's not the 10-year anniversary, it's the 50th anniversary. So Mario Savio uttered those lines to the officials of the University of California about 100 yards away over in Sproul Plaza um, 50 years ago today. So I want to acknowledge those rebels, both Mario, his colleagues, uh, the students at the time, and Sebastian and all the all his colleagues at the time and all of you for being rebels today. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, where was I? So, um, what I want to do is uh, I have this wonderful opportunity to uh, introduce this, uh, the t our two scholars today, and this is a great tradition. I have to say this. Um, this uh, I, I've, I've come to admire the result of that rebellion, which is the Robotic Science and Systems Conference. It, is, uh, it has been a, a wonderful to watch its trajectory over the past decade. And this year has been a milestone, a huge inflection point in robotics in our field. And fittingly, it's, ba it's here at this location that has been um, tremendously s organized. And I, I, wanna, I also want to say thank you to everyone involved with the organization of this, from all of the reviewers to the organizers to have been planning this for years and years. Particularly, I want to thank uh, Sachin Patil, who got married earlier this month and was uh, trapped in India in a visa problem 
uh, until just a week ago, and then got out in time to get here and has been spending a huge amount of time. He and Peter Abiel have been working tirelessly. Peter just got tenure and hasn't had a chance to celebrate because he's been working so hard on all of this, uh, on, on this conference. So I just want to take an also a second to acknowledge the two of them for that. <laughs> and <coughs> I don't even think they're here because they're, uh, they're out there working so hard. Okay, so enough about all that. I'm going to have a, I'm now going to introduce um, uh, Julie, and uh, she is, um, she's tremendous. We've been watching her um, closely over the last few years. She has a, um, a background uh, at MIT. She has uh, degrees from um, the aeronautics program there, her undergrad and grad and PhD work. But um, she then went to work for a year at Boeing. And what's fascinating about her is that she's, uh, she, she's a roboticist, but also uh, works in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, um, the sibling area of automation. So that's particularly dear to my heart. I appreciate that she does such great work there. And she's fascinated by the, the human factors, how to bring, um, <coughs> how humans and machines can work together efficiently. And what she applies is methods from, from AI, from human factors, from operations research, fundamental rigorous approaches to scheduling and coordinating of these kind of team systems using fundamental elements from logic and probability. And so she's, she's produced a series of results that are, that are important and fascinating. She publishes in a, uh, a broad variety of journals, um, SMC, Reliability Journal, Human Factors, Field Robotics, IJRR, HRI, CASE, and of course she's published a number of things here at RSS. She's won the Early Career Award, number of Best Paper Awards, and now is a professor at MIT where she leads the Interactive Robotics Group. Julie. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, my name is Julie Shaw, and uh, I'm going to be talking today about robots that work in teams with people and the ways that we can harness the strengths of people and robots working together. My area of research is human-robot interaction, and I work on developing new computational techniques that enable robots to plan and schedule to work flexibly with people to improve our capability and productivity across a number of settings, including manufacturing, military field operations, and emergency response. So today I'll talk about manufacturing because we know this is the hot topic. We know it's a hot topic because the New York Times tells us it is, Scientific American, even Bill Gates. And for most of the world, there's a choice to be made, and that choice is people or robots. Either people do the work or robots do the work. And while most of the world is probably on the side of the people, I think we're a special community because we tend to root for the robots, but that's neither here nor there. If we look at where we've used robots in the past and how we use robots today, it's actually not an unreasonable extrapolation that this does need to be an either-or proposition. If I were to ask, you to ask you to give me an example of an industry where robots have been highly successful at taking our jobs, you might name the automotive industry. We're used to seeing large robots build up the bodies of cars without a person in sight. Now the thing about this is that this is not really a success story of robots, this is a success story of people with resources, very significant resources, capable of basically redesigning everything about building a car, the factory layout, the processes around the current capabilities of industrial robots. This includes making them highly structured, repeatable, and then of course they see the benefit in their investment due to high volume. Now this can't be done everywhere, and the secret, one of the secrets is that it can't even be done in the automotive industry. A little known fact is that 50% of the process of building up a car today is actually still done entirely by people. That's final assembly, it takes up half the factory footprint and half the build schedule. Other industries lag further behind in their use of robotics. Building large commercial airplanes is still done 70% by people, not final assembly, the entire assembly process. It's a beehive of people putting together these large planes. 90% of the work involved in assembling the cell phones in your pockets is done manually. And much of the work done by small business manufacturing in the US as well. So across all these different industries, there are a number of different reasons why it's very difficult to automate this work. I've had the extraordinary privilege of working on a factory floor and visiting factories in a number of different settings. And what I can tell you is that the opportunity here is not in making better robots capable of doing this huge swath of manual work. The enormous opportunity that's in front of us right today is the fact that little pieces of all of this work can be done by robotic systems today. 
What we're not able to do is successfully integrate these robots into the human context, integrate them seamlessly into human work practices. So there are a number of barriers that stand in our way. Up until very recently, these barriers have literally been physical. Robots had to be caged to be kept physically separate from people. But we're now seeing safety standards and technical specifications that allow us to uncage these systems. Rather than enforcing safety through physical barriers, we use sensing computation to sense where the person is in the space and slow and stop the robot system. So if we look at an example of this implementation in our lab, we see a person working with a robot. And what you'll notice is that they each have their own pieces of work to do. The robot begins moving. And as the person gets in the robot's way, that robot slows and it stops for the person to come in and do their work. What else do you notice? You notice the robot is slowed and stopped an awful lot. And this is the fundamental problem. It's actually fairly easy to make a system safe if you make it also highly inefficient. So this is, the, this is the enabling step. We can now unleash, uncage these robots, put them in the same physical space as people. But the challenge ahead of us is not just how to make them safe, but how do we make them smart enough to also work efficiently with people. And there are computational challenges surrounding this. There are also human challenges. And I'll talk a little bit about both. Around the computational challenges, uh, the computational challenges arise from the fact that we have work in the shared physical space that needs to be done both by people and by robots. Our industry collaborators call this the coexistence problem. And today, when we need people to come into the space where the robots do work, the robot cell is shut down for the entire duration the person is in that space. What we want instead is to enable robots to flexibly work, share, and adapt. If a person requests to come into the space for a certain amount of time, we'd like the robots to reallocate, resequence, and reschedule their work to make a safe environment for that person, while also ensuring that the process constraints will be satisfied. Now, when we're sharing shared physical space, in the manufacturing task, we also typically have upper bound and lower bound temporal constraints. These upper bound, lower bound temporal constraints and resource constraints become highly intercoupled over the fact that these agents need to negotiate the shared physical space. The result is that proprietary techniques used in industry, the, fast, the fastest AI and OR solvers, will typically take a half hour, an hour, or more to recompute schedules in response to a disturbance for these types of task sets. This is OK if you very have infrequent disturbances, but it's not acceptable for a system that really needs to interoperate uh, in a more human environment with um, more frequent disturbances. So what we do is we observe that this is a problem that AI and OR cares about, but there are other communities that care about this sort of scheduling problem as well. And one of those communities is the real-time processor scheduling community. And they approach the problem from a different tack. Rather than developing search algorithms which take exponential time in the worst case to compute, they develop fast schedulability tests in order to be able to accommodate changing task sets. So what we did was observe that, well, we can try to reformulate this problem as a real-time processor scheduling problem, where the robots or the people, the agents, are processors within a multi-core computer, and the physical space that they access uh, are modeled as shared memory resources. Remember, in the manufacturing setting, we also have upper and lower bound temporal constraints. It turns out that this problem with upper and lower bound temporal constraints maps to a problem that's of an increasing interest to the real-time processor scheduling community due to the increasing prevalence of PPUs and GPUs. So what we can do is reformulate this problem as what's called a task, as what's called a task suspending, sorry, a self-suspending task model. Can you still hear me? Sort of? Okay. As a self-suspending task model and develop a fast uh, and tight capability test for this form of the model. Um, let's see. So, so the way we design a schedulability test for this sort of task set is we restrict the behavior of the scheduler, and then we leverage the structure of the network. So we do have schedulability tests that have been designed in the past for restricted forms of the self-suspending task model. Any, num uh, any number of tasks, but each task only has two subtasks, for example. What we've, what we've done is generalize uh, this approach to be able to handle task sets with any number of tasks any number of subtasks, and any number of self-suspensions, or more general forms of uh, temporal constraints. And we compute the schedulability test for non-preemptive task sets. Can anybody guess why non-preemption is important for us? In real-time processor scheduling, it's OK to sort of chop up your activities to meet your constraints. People generally don't like to be arbitrarily interrupted in their work. So analysis of non-preemptive task sets is important for us. What we do is we take this schedulability test and we embed it within uh, standard solvers for mixed integer linear programs. 
and that allows us to scale these solution techniques to much larger sizes. What we're able to show is that we can compute task sets with up to 10 agents uh, extended out recently to 700 tasks, often within about 10 seconds. And we've had the opportunity to benchmark this against proprietary methods as well. We're able to show a 10% or more improvement in schedule quality. So this has application in a number of different areas, but I'm most excited for the application it has in the manufacturing setting for more flexible uses of standard industrial robots. If a person comes into the space, the robots can reallocate, resequence, reschedule their work. If a robot fails, again, we can reallocate, resequence, reschedule the work. It provides a form of interactivity as well. Uh, an operator can change the task set, change deadlines, add tasks, remove tasks, and we can continue on without this time-consuming recomputation process. We're incredibly fortunate to work with outstanding industry collaborators that are working currently to transition this to the factory floor. And the timing of this talk is amazing because for the first time, I can show you pictures um, from out at Boeing. This is, um, uh, was just unveiled Monday and is the new automation strategy for the 777 fuselage build. Um, in, in terms of our research, our research continues on. So we have a mechanism for, for dynamic scheduling of single robots, or sorry, single cells within the factory. Uh, our current efforts are working on generalizing these techniques to stochastic methods and distributed methods so that at some point in the near future, we can dynamically schedule a full factory with people and robots working together. So from here, we'll take a little bit of a transition point, and uh, I'll use um, Boeing as an example to move from um, computational uh, challenges to human challenges. I had the fantastic opportunity of working at Boeing for a year before starting on the faculty, and I was working in robotics and automation strategies for uh, building airplanes. And what was astonishing for me to learn on the factory floor, but turns out surprises nobody else um, in, in factories where, where people do manual work, um, what astonished me is that the plane was actually built differently from day to day and shift to shift. So um, wherever, it turns out, wherever you have manual work, people tend to develop, to develop highly individualized styles for performing this work. And what this means, practically for me, for example, is that I can't program a robot to work uh, interdependently with people and program it for one team or one person and expect that to be an efficient solution for another person or another team, unless we, of course, make people act like robots and force them to do the same thing over and over again. So this raises the question of how we design individualized task plans and schedules for coordinating work uh, of robots and people. There is a computational challenge to this. So assuming we do have a good model of the timing or rhythm of a person's actions, we want to be able to adjust the timing or rhythm of the robot's actions in response to real-time updates from the, what, what the person is doing. So to address this problem, we developed a, uh, a method of compiling a flexible optimal scheduling policy where the robot can optimize the precise timing of its actions according to a model, but if the person deviates from those timings, we still have a mechanism for quickly recomputing the schedule in response to that deviation. So we're showing a video here of two people working with this robot. It's, uh, it's a, a mock sort of spar assembly task. The robot's applying sealant, the person is placing fasteners, and this person's style for doing this work is to place all fasteners and then go back and drill them in. The constraint here is that seal the fasteners need to be placed within about three seconds of sealant application before the sealant drives. You can see the robot stayed just ahead of the person in performing this work, and that's what we want. We want uh, the, the robot to conform to the timing of the person's actions. Here another person comes in and they have a different style for performing the work. You see they're drilling before they move on. And you, you might notice here that the robot actually slows down the timing of its actions in response to that deviation to remain just ahead of the person. And this is helpful in terms of moving us towards more fluent behavior, more of what we see in human teams. We, we're very good about subtly adjusting the timing of our actions based on our observations of our teammates. But it leaves open the question of where these models come from. How is it we develop effective models for fluent teamwork between people and robots? And in thinking about this, it, it, when we look at human teams, we can't expect a, a team of people to work effectively together if we don't have the opportunity to train and practice together, right? So the idea here is, well, how do we support robots in, in uh, co-developing models for working together in teams with people? Uh, more the way people work uh, to develop models for working in teams um, with each other. 
And what we, what we observe is that when we look at most of the techniques for training robots today, they're really designed for one-way transfer of information from the person to the robot. We're trying to train the robot to do something. Uh, we might train it through reward assignment. The robot does something, you say good. The robot does something, you say bad. Um, these are the techniques uh, that we use, for example, for training dogs. What we know from the human team training literature is that these sorts of techniques are actually documented as among the most inefficient mechanisms for people learning to work with other people. So the question is, can we take insight from effective human team training practices and redesign these models to support more effective human robot team training? So what we did was uh, develop a computational method of implementing the gold standard human team training technique called cross-training. This is where people learn team fluency team fluency through explicitly exchanging roles. I try my job for a while, and then I try your job. The theory behind this is that it, it enhances the development of shared mental models. Um, there's something about us as humans where if we take someone else's job for a while, we come back and do our job. We now not only know how to do our job, we know how to do our partner's job, and we're very good at changing how we do our work for the benefit of the team with an understanding of what our partner needs. So can we implement uh, a training mechanism that allows a robot to co-develop this model, develop a model of its own policy performing the work, but also adapt the model or a pol uh, its model of how the human is going to do the work, and take the inputs for, for developing this model through mechanisms uh, that we know work highly effectively in human teams. So what we did was compare our computational framework for cross-training to uh, a standard algorithm for training robots through interactive reward assignment uh, that's been used in a number of other um, robotic settings. And we had 36 people come into the lab. We randomly, randomly assigned them to one of two conditions, trained to work with the robot through cross-training or trained through uh, reward assignment. We had the person and robot trained together in a virtual environment. We do that because cross-training is inherently limited. If the robot could do the person's job, the robot probably already would be doing the person's job. But in many settings, it is practical to sort of fake the choreography of switching roles in a virtual environment or in a graphical user interface. And that's what we did here. The person and robot then worked together in real life to perform the task. We measured uh, metrics of team fluency and also um, uh, subjective measures through post-experimental questionnaire. The task that we had the person and robot perform was fairly simple. It was a place and drill task. The person places the screws and the robot drills them in. And we told the people to train the robot to work with them in whatever way they felt was appropriate. There were two types of people. There were the smart people who knew this was a dangerous industrial robot and actively trained the robot to stay out of their area till they had placed all three screws. And then we had people who clearly did not fear the robot and wanted to work as fast as possible and trained the robot to basically uh, drill as soon as they placed. So I'll show you two videos from execution for that more efficient style of teamwork. This is uh, a person and robot working together after training uh, through reward assignment. What you see is the person places the first screw, and they pause and they hesitate. Is the robot going to move? I don't know. I'll make my next move now. And as the robot starts moving, they pull their hand out of the space. Now, qualitatively, it looks like the person is a, a little bit hesitant, is a little bit unsure about what the robot will do next. I'll show you the next video, which is uh, a different person uh, working with the robot after training through cross-training. And what we see looks different. The person makes their next move. They're more comfortable staying in the same space as the robot, as the robot's moving. And these two examples aren't cherry-picked. Actually, we did see robust statistically significant differences. We saw a 41% de decrease in human idle time and a 71% increase in concurrent motion between the person and the robot. We also saw subjective differences in the subjective measures. Our participants agreed more strongly that they trusted the robot and that the robot performed according to their preference after training through cross-training. These are arguably even more important than the objective measures because ultimately it's the human factors, it's human acceptance that either makes or breaks a technology. So where do we go from here? Well, this was uh, a first simple experiment uh, implementing the gold standard in human team training techniques where we'd expect to see the biggest uh, potential improvement through implementing a technique like this. But cross-training is inherently limited. It requires small teams, heterogeneous teams, that are capable of actually switching roles. And so from here, we're moving on to think about, uh, thinking about implementing alternate forms of human team training, which we know to be effective, uh, such as perturbation training, training over and over, but 
uh, with slight perturbations in your task. And we know from human team studies that this also helps uh, us to develop uh, team fluency at execution. So what I've talked uh, about in this presentation uh, is about robots that are able to more flexibly plan, reallocate, resequence, and change the timing of their actions in response to people. We talked about robots that can learn the way to work with people based on just how the person wants to work with them uh, through experience and practice. But where are we headed? So this is, this, these are steps in a direction where we can, we can really talk about bringing the two parts together. A lot of work in planning and scheduling really lends itself towards computation. People are generally not very good at scheduling tasks, yet they're forced to do it today in many settings, in factories and out in the field. As we, as we uh, sort of develop uh, robot partners and teammates that interoperate with us in these environments, we can raise the question of how is it that we harness the strengths of computation, the strengths of these machines, the strengths of their ability to churn on large data, and, and collaboratively make decisions that support the team. And so we're uh, so conducting uh, studies in collaborative decision making in factories. These are relatively easier settings because we can potentially have full knowledge of the world state in a factory. We can have full um, uh, connectivity and bandwidth in a factory. And from there, move it towards domains where we don't have those things, where we have significant information and communication uncertainty, such as out in the field. And with that, um, you know, uh, I can wrap up. So the main takeaways from this are that we're making robots safe, but that's only the first step. The question is how do we make them smart enough to work effectively with us in time critical, safety critical domains. We need robots that adapt when, what, and how they work to collaboratively execute plans with us. We need robots that learn through experience and practice in ways that, uh, that we effectively learn so that we can co-develop our models for effective teamwork. And um, I want to end by thanking my absolutely outstanding team um, that, that, um, that I work with. Um, Matthew Gombele, Ron Wilcox, these are the graduate students that perform the work in, um, uh, in scheduling uh, of human robot teams. Pemla Soda and Stephanos Nicolaitis work in close proximity interaction with dangerous industrial robots and the, the co-team training techniques. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. <laughs>